uh, what I'll try and do is after each section, probably take a, a pause. And if there are questions uh, that you'd like to talk about, uh, aspects that you'd like to discuss, I think it's important. I know uh, the protocol has been at the end of the session, but many a times, you know, when something is in your mind and a question, a thought that's in your mind and you don't uh, put it out, um, uh, we, we kind of lose that the chain of thought. So uh, with that, what I plan to cover is uh, current landscape of the regulatory changes that have occurred in the pharmaceutical medical device sector, uh, some of the key risks in the health sector, healthcare sector, um, and then we'll talk about some of the case studies and then to top it up, what are the controls that, uh, you know, we are seeing, we are recommending to some of our clients in terms of enhancements. Obviously, uh, you know, you can put all the controls, but then uh, business uh, becomes impractical to run as a result of which every company will have to assess uh, how many of these controls should be put in uh, and we'll discuss some of those. So broadly in terms of uh, you know the landscape that has changed specifically as it relates to uh, the new regulations uh, em emerging from the income tax act i know it's a busy slide but primarily over the years right um, what has been um, said so especially this is in relation to the hcp interactions and hcps for this sector are key because they are the uh, connects between the health sector and the ultimate patient and the hcps are guided by uh, you know the mci regulations that is their code of conduct in terms of their behavior their conduct what they can accept what they cannot accept from um, more so the pharmaceutical industry so however over the past years right and there have been various debates various court cases each high court ruling in a different fashion in relation to the nexus and some of this i'll say, I'll say without uh, sugar coating uh, you know there's a known nexus between uh, the industry and hcps the healthcare professionals in terms of changing in the prescribing habits but the pharma companies the med device companies have always taken the, the ground that the mci regulations do not apply to them right um, the finance act um, of 22 and then immediately thereafter the super Supreme Court judgment uh, that has come up in the apex matter has changed the landscape whereby the act introduces uh, Puja, you go to the yeah Puja. is the screen not showing no, no it's not showing the presentation mode yeah so the What's basically the act says is disallowance of any benefits or perquisites uh, in whatever form that is in violation of the law. And then Supreme Court judgment in the apex matter tops it up, whereby it puts to rest all the disagreements or different versions or different judgments that have been quoted on the pharma um, ACP nexus that has been, uh, you know, out in the media depending on the high court. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the, uh, while this is not a tax uh, session and I'm not a tax expert, but uh, the tax piece drives the change in the legislation. Right? And over the years, the Finance Act, uh, which is the Income Tax Act, always had this clause which says that, uh, you know, deductions of any revenue expenditure so any expense that has been incurred um, for the purpose of business or profession is allowed however claim of some such expenses if it has been incurred for the purpose which is either an offense or prohibited of law is denied which is very logical to say you know you can claim expenses for your business or profession however if there is a uh, you know, if it is a, if the expense is incurred, which is in violation of a law or a, uh, you know, offense, then you can't claim it. For example, you know, in our personal lives, so if, if we are professionals, say for a doctor, and then you get uh, a, a traffic ticket, right? Um, you Yes, you went to visit a patient, you get a traffic ticket because you parked your car in the wrong place. 
you can't claim that as an expense. A very basic example, but uh, that is the, the purpose of what was set out. Similarly, on the there was a CBDT circular uh, way back in 2012, which talked about, and this is more from a tax perspective, which says that providing freebies to medical practitioners in violation of the MCI regulations is not deductible. Again, this is more from a tax perspective, not so much enforced. Uh, the other aspect here is that there is no definition of freebies. Definition Freebies, the word freebies was not defined. However, um, there's some comment that has come up. However, uh, the uh, general in general parlance, when you talk of freebies, that would be any benefit or perquisite. Right? And so what happened was, and that's the result of why we had all these cases in different high courts. Um, to put an end to that, the Finance Act, that is this year's act, uh, you know, was revised where it, it brought in an additional provision, which is the second bullet, right? So in terms of disallowance of expenditure, and it says to provide any benefit or perquisite in whatever form, right? That is the key element is benefit or perquisite in what would entail a benefit or perquisite to the receiver. That is important. And here in this context, the receiver is the healthcare professional. And any benefit or perquisite which is in violation of law. So now the law, MCI law, you've got the MCI code of ethics, which is a statute and it's a law. So anything that the HCP accepts, which is in violation of the MCI code of ethics, would be uh, a benefit or a perquisite if it is given free of cost to the HCP. Right? And then they've added a TDS provision to this to say, uh, you know, 10% uh, TDS needs to be deducted by the giver of the benefit, uh, the benefit or the perquisite. Okay. Um, let's move on. The, the provisions of the Supreme Court Right. Uh, again, the case that was, uh, you know, with the Supreme Court was of a pharma company. Now they had kind of gone overboard in terms of conference uh, fees that were paid, gold coins, fridges, white goods. Uh, what we've seen in the last few years, uh, some of you know, most of the pharma companies have stopped giving white goods. However, you had a, a gifting pattern that continued, and as a result of the Supreme Court judgment, this has been put to bed to say the Supreme Court judgment as well as the income tax change that has come about, whereby it's not only the previously the uh, the income tax act was hung on the, the aspect of freebies, but now they've introduced the concept of the perquisite or a benefit. What happens with that is a section in the income tax act has been introduced, which is section 194R. Now, previously, there were other sections of uh, the Income Tax Act, but the section R, which is introduced, and it has a limit of rupees 20,000. So any benefit or perquisite given to an HCP in excess of 20,000, you need a, a, the company needs to, to deduct TDS at the rate of 10%. By virtue of doing so, so you're, the company is going to be deducting the 10% TDS on it. However, it is then um, what happens, the implication of that is that the company that is giving the benefit or the perquisite to the HCP has to a certain extent agreed that a benefit has been given to the HCP. And if a benefit or a perquisite has been given to the HCP, then it is in contradiction of the MCI code of conduct where the doctor or the HCP is, should not be accepting a benefit or a perquisite. And that is the tricky part and a slippery slope that companies have to uh, you know, ensure that they take care. Uh, the important element here is most companies still believe that if we deduct the 10% TDS, what is the harm? Because we are paying our taxes. The tax element is one aspect of it. However, if you go back to the Supreme Court judgment and which disallows any benefit or perquisite and reading the income tax act it would be a violation of the the law right so that is the context in which 
perquisites, benefits, and the section 194 needs to be read with. Any, I, I see some questions around this. Uh, do we want to cover this before we move on to the, the next part? Uh, I think if it is okay, then otherwise, if, if you feel like it's breaking the flow, probably at the end we can take no, so This was more in terms of the change in the regulatory landscape uh, before right. we move on to the, the area of uh, you know frauds and uh, those aspects. Yes, I thought yes. it's important to cover this element here. Yeah, yeah, please, please do. So the first question is, what is the mechanism envisaged for tagging benefits provided to ACPs from pharma company perspective as per law? Do we have something similar to Sunshine Act? Currently, no. So the Sunshine Act is more onerous in terms of, you know, even consulting agreements. Um, so, you know, a lot of companies are engaging in consulting agreements. This portion of the regulatory change relates only to um, the benefit so you know if i call it a gift or a in clinic item or a brand reminder now there's a debate on this brand reminder part of it there is a debate on the samples part of it because currently the way the law stands as well as the clarifications that have been issued by the cbdt also include the samples part of it uh, while representations to the high level commission uh, committee that has been formed by the government to look into this code is uh, you know also evaluating the recommendations that have come gone from the pharma associations that is the tricky area but as of now it is more incumbent upon the company to maintain a tracking of the benefits and the freebies that have been given uh, in if it's in excess of the 20000 limit per hcp so it's the 20000 limit is from the the giver is the company the pharma company and the recipient is the acp so it's a one to one if you hit the limit of 20000 then you need to deduct the tds the next question is <coughs> is it acp need to personally benefit from the perquisite example samples yes i covered that part uh, it's still uh, as of now the way uh, the the law has been the tax act has been written and the clarifications that have been issued uh, samples would get rolled in uh, and as i said representations are being made um, to the high level commission uh, high level committee in terms of samples and the reason samples have been put in right if we look at it the 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 reason a sample is given to an acp and the acp is not going to consume all the samples right it's the product samples are then distributed to the patients to get experience right thereby the the uh, the hcp gets experience on uh, you know uh, how the patient behavior uh, you know is in relation to the samples some pharma companies have gone overboard whereby large quantities of samples are then given to uh, hcps and then there is a separate market that sells these samples and that is the part that the government wants to crack on Based exactly. Our, yeah. Sorry, Darshan. So just sure. to add in here, based on our experience, what we are seeing is uh, because of you know some of these regulatory changes, what companies are doing is that they are stopping some of these activities, but moving and spending more on the consultancy agreement side, uh, which prima facie is okay. Uh, you know, you could engage HCPs for doing CMEs, for doing advisory boards, conducting market surveys. Uh, but at the same time, what companies are not being cautious about is the way in which they are doing these events. Uh, do these events demonstrate real occurrences? Do they demonstrate a real need of it? Or is it only paperwork to pay off the HCP? That's the area where you know companies are being a little bit more cautious. Yeah, so uh, exactly. Consult. Someone's put a comment saying consulting agreements is a vehicle used to bypass. Uh, ideally, that's how it's, you know, you need to engage in a agreement. Uh, if you're going to engage with an HCP, have an agreement, set out uh, the value and set out the scope of services. Uh, but unfortunately, the mindset uh, over the, the years is how do we uh, entice uh, the HCP? And if the white goods and other aspects can't be given benefits and perquisites can't be given, 
let's engage into uh, you know let's engage the hcp via an agreement and we'll make the payment uh, again yes absolutely uh, true uh, i think mr rohit has a question he's raised his hand All right. If no questions, uh, let's move on. So we'll quickly Hello. cover. Oh, good morning, Darshan yeah. sir. This is Rohit yes. here. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. session. So I just have a small doubt. Like how you mentioned about this NCA and also the Unified Code of Medical Practitioners, these are applicable to medical practitioners, the doctors and the RMPs as such. But what if, I think as per UCMP also, we know that if any seminar is conducted by the companies, it should be the air travel ticket or the uh, conveyance, everything should be borne by the medical practitioner at his own cost and not by the companies. But what if in case the companies incur them, like for example, if you think HCPA, the companies even who have given the bribe or something, they are sub subject to fine and penalty. Is there any such law in India which says that, okay, no, it's not just for its medical practitioners. Companies who are even dealing with the, giving the air ticket cost to the delegates or the spending the travel, uh, hotel cost of a delegate. That's also punishable as something. Is there any law such thing prevailing in India? <laughs> so currently, the there are draft codes, the UCPMP and the multi, you know the devices code. The, again, that is draft. So per se, uh, if you look at it, if you compare it to uh, the US FCPA or other acts uh, that exist around the world, uh, you know, there isn't similarly enforcement action isn't that stringent either. Um, we're getting, you know, we, we're getting there, right? Uh, the government is now keen to, uh, you know, ensure that these kind of practices uh, do not continue. And that's why a committee has been formed. I think some of the, the penalties, uh, you know, that were laid out uh, as part of the drafts, that is the UCPMP, uh, you know, industry as well as the, the companies felt that uh, they were particularly harsh where a, a confirmation from the CEO in terms of compliance and uh, you know uh, stopping of manufacturing uh, of uh, products uh, or sale of products uh, was put in uh, as part of the penalties provisions. Um, you know, internationally, generally, it's been you pay a fine, um, you know, but uh, there is no restriction on continuing to produce and continuing to sell. Uh, there is a differentiation between. Uh, how international regulators are looking at some of the, uh, you know, I would say misbehaviors or misconducts conducted by uh, some of the pharma companies, as well as the med device companies, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Indian regulations. And I believe that, uh, again, as part of the representations that are going from the industry, there is a comparison in terms of what are the actions that a regulator can take if a company uh, you know, there is a misconduct on the part of mis of there is a misconduct on the part of a company uh, as, as part of their selling practices. Thank you, Prashant, sir. Right. Um, if we move on, so this is more at a high level uh, again from the ACFE, uh, you know, uh, report. Um, Health industries, if you look at it, uh, you know, cyber crime is something um, is at the topmost. Uh, we probably all read through, uh, you know, in the last one week, Ames had a incident of cyber attack. Uh, whilst we will, we don't anticipate covering cyber, uh, you know, uh, at this point in time in this session, we can have an, another session specifically devoted to, uh, you know, the whole cyber security uh the issue part of it but these are more in terms of statistics um, specifically as it relates to healthcare vis-a-vis -vis other industries uh, that are being published let's move on so what are the so and i'll cover this in two phases one is on the pharma value chain and the second is on the the hospitals but if we look at it uh, you know, what are the risks and the challenges? And when we call out risks, a risk entails a fraud risk. Uh, as long as there are controls that companies have put into place um, and to minimize the occurrence of the risk, uh, the better. Now, um, you know, and that's where an assessment of 
uh, whether the the emerging risks have been covered as part of uh, the controls. Uh, that is something that uh, companies need to evaluate on a regular basis. But if we look at it broadly, and there are in, this is not uh, this is an illustrative list of uh, risks and challenges that the pharma companies see. But uh, I'm sure you, in your capacity, specifically as it relates to the region that you're in, uh, there are various pharma companies and, as well as hospitals. And you would have seen others as well. But this is more us sharing our experiences in terms of what are the issues. And then, you know, if there's a risk and there is a, a fraud, uh, we've, we've kind of helped out investigate. So on the regulatory side, you have a big issue in terms of the, the corruption issue. A um, couple of months back, there was a, uh, in the media, one of the, uh, one of the companies was hauled up, uh, specifically as it relates to obtaining certain licenses, they, where they engaged a third party, and it had an impact on not only the share prices, but a, a detailed scrutiny was undertaken uh, because the third party had helped obtain uh, some of the licenses. Now, uh, you know, that's one of the third party risks and we'll cover it in a little bit detail, but licenses, permits, not only for your products, but, you know, the way you do business, uh, that is a risk that continues uh, in, in uh, you know, not only this sector, but across sectors as part of, you know, I guess if we look at it uh, and you may ask others as well, you would have always heard that this is how business is done in India, right? The other aspect is the best price. So when you're when you're selling uh, products to the government, right, uh, you are supposed to be giving your best price, uh, the lowest price, right? What are the controls that the company has to be able to make that statement that this is the best price? In, and we've seen instances where, you know, controls either controls to make a affirmative statement are lax as a result of which later on um, there is a scrutiny on those companies in terms of um, because uh, the, the regulators are looking right and if they're able to identify issues where products have been sold um, you know it could be various schemes and but the net price uh, at which a product is sold to others uh, other than the government um, you know, which is high, lower than the price at which products are sold to uh, the government, uh, then we've, we've seen companies getting some of these notices as well. Yeah. Um, I won't cover the next one, which is more violations and issuance of warning letters. It had stopped to a certain extent uh, during COVID times, but again, now this is on the rise. Um, whilst there has been a significant improvement in our uh, the manufacturing practices, I guess uh, there are areas that need improvement. The, 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 the other risk is on the contract manufacturing, and it's not only the manufacturing, but you also have issues in terms of, um, you know, the, when you're getting a component manufactured, specifically in the pharma sense, right? There is a IPR associated with that component. Right. So you may do a due diligence, you may have reference checks, you may have, you know, SOPs that you've laid out. Um, we've seen instances where, you know, it's not the, the contract manufacturer per se, but it's employees, ultimately frauds committed by employees and employees, be it your employees, be it employees of a contract manufacturer, there would be issues of, uh, you know, the IPR part where, the, the employees of the contract manufacturer may take some part of it and then set up their own shop. And that's a big, big concern that we've kind of helped clients with. Again, on the toll manufacturing, um, generally in the agreements, we've seen that there is a slight range that is given, um, you know, some kind of lee leeway to the toll manufacturer, to the contract manufacturer in the yield percentage. Right? And uh, depending on the quantum of the production, uh, you know, if it's a large quantum, then that yield percentage uh, may, uh, you know, assist, uh, and I use the word assist with a smirk, uh, the, you know, the toll manufacturer in, in kind of uh, reporting a lower yield of the product, 
right? Uh, and then there's always a, 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 to a certain extent, certain float, if I might say, where uh, the balance of the raw materials can then be uh, either sold or used in other production or actually used and you know additional products being pushed out to you but the second part generally doesn't happen it's more where you know product x x quantity is received is supposed to convert and pass back to you and you will allow a certain um, you know margin in terms of um, you know the yield that's where the additional raw material that's unused may be sold off by uh, the toll manufacturer. Uh, moving on to the unethical, uh, you know, HCP interactions, we covered them previously, and I'd just like to talk a little bit about the point Pooja made is, uh, you know, proof of service, right? Um, like we have uh, a lot of pharma companies now because of the stoppage to a certain extent of the white goods are all moving towards, uh, you know, consulting agreements, uh, which is good. However, if I take a few examples, uh, you know, a lot of pharma companies have ad boards and they, they, they maintain minutes, but ultimately uh, nothing happens. Uh, you know, so, some pharma companies do actually take uh, the inputs given by HCPs, uh, but a majority of them uh, don't take uh, those inputs uh, to heart or action those inputs, right? So uh, what basically then it, it tantamounts to a, a way of giving back to the HCP uh, a certain um, you know, amount so that it induces them to prescribe. Or you have uh, camps uh, or you have you know, surveys, you know, post-marketing surveys that a lot of companies are engaging with. Uh, engaging in where you know uh, you've got contracts with 500 1000 hcps and uh, you know uh, the hcp fills in the forms sends it over about 10 to 15 questions very basic questions you don't need to be a doctor to fill actually most of those questions uh, you know the assistant at the uh, at the doctor's uh, clinic can actually fill some of those but uh, you know when you take a step back how did the survey help the organization that cannot be proved. What did you do with the results of the survey cannot be proved. So some of those aspects in terms of, you know, tying the knot uh, in terms of the documentation that is collated by the company becomes important. Um, moving on to the, the risks and challenges of label marketing. Again, a, a issue with patented products. We had an instance where it was a cardio, uh, it was a, uh, a drug for cancer and but uh, you know that also helped while it wasn't proven but it also helped for uh, the, the eye right and we'd had uh, our client had received uh, you know letters from the regulator saying why were certain uh, products uh, that were more um, for cancer uh, being sold to ophthalmologists right and um, a, a significant amount of uh, when we did the investigation, we identified that it was more at the third parties who were selling off whilst the company had maintained uh, that this is a product which is primarily for cancer um, oncology. Um, you know, the distributor knowing well because it's an international product um, was selling it uh, to uh, ophthalmologists. Promotional spends, uh, absolutely. Uh, again, what is it that you're getting from third parties in terms of amounts that have been put put out and expensed? Um, I, I think that is, uh, uh, you know, important to look at. A lot of print materials uh, are being printed, but um, are we actually getting some of those? Print is just one of those aspects, but various promotion uh, spends and marketing spends in terms of, you know, events being conducted. Um, are we getting value for money is one of the important elements. Um, parallel trades, imports, we've had issues where specifically products, uh, you know, coming in from international, uh, you know, for international companies from headquarters into India. Generally, when these products come in, uh, they are at a much lower price than the, uh, the price at which they're sold internationally. And we've had, uh, we've had clients specifically 
where some of these products have actually gone back into uh, the international market. And in one case, they were actually sold uh, in the country where our client was headquartered at a price much lower than um, you know, uh, what was being sold by the company in the headquarters, right? uh, leading to a investigation of saying, how did, where did this product come from? Uh, yes, the batch numbers are there, so it's easy to identify where these batches were shipped, but then where was the leakage, which, uh, you know, distributor leaked it out um, and doing an analysis of, uh, doing an analysis of, uh, you know, the sales as well as, uh, you know, the exit points such that some of these products uh, could go back to the international markets. We've also had um, issues in terms of, uh, sorry, not we, our clients have had issues in terms of uh, certain products containing uh, substances. And when I say substances, uh, you know, primarily those uh, medicines are used for as substance, as alternatives for substance abuse. I won't get into the specific chemical because if I say that, most of you will uh, know which client I'm talking about, but believe me, it was a issue where uh, it, as part of the bilateral trades with one of our neighboring countries, uh, you know, it was one of the items whereby, uh, you know, uh, it was put, it was agreed between the two, the Indian government and the neighboring government, uh, the government of the neighboring country, where, you know, beyond uh, trade and release of certain prisoners, that India had to ensure that additional controls were put into place such that this product did not flow from India uh, you know, to the boundaries of the other neighboring country. Um, we've, we've seen schemes where, you know, uh, misuse of promotional schemes, you, you've got multiple schemes that pharma companies uh, float uh, for its distributors, for its third parties. And, uh, you know, again, looking at it, yes, the, when the schemes are launched, absolutely uh, they are for, you know, to induce uh, the third parties and uh, retailers to sell their product. But what are the controls around some of those schemes that the, uh, the company has put into place? Because, uh, you know, secondary sales information, uh, generally most companies don't get, and it's more hearsay, uh, from the market in terms of, um, you know, products that are being sold. And we've seen uh, issues specifically as it relates to, uh, you know, promotional uh, items uh, being uh, misused by third parties. And many times going back to uh, the HCPs as well from there. On the counterfeiting risk, uh, significant not only the packaging, but also the product. Again, tracking down uh, the vendor and it's, it's got to be the, the genesis of the risk is it's not that your product is taken and someone, you know, duplicates the product. There are other components uh, where whereby leakage of information could be IPR or other information that is leaked by certain employees uh, of the company or third parties leading to the risk of counterfeiting where, uh, you know, the labeling, the, not only the content, but the, the labeling and the packaging is, uh, you know, um, duplicated, and it's it's a primarily identified through uh, market intelligence, trying to get to the bottom of it in terms of where some of these products are made, uh, where is the labeling made? Uh, you know, uh, so it needs some amount of market intelligence and feet on the ground to conduct these activities. Um, the next one is the near expiry, and we've had. We've, we've helped clients where clients, some of our clients um, have sold products. Uh, and it's again, not the client, the company per se, certain individuals who are trying to make, uh, you know, uh, personal gains have discounted products, which are near expiry and sold to third parties. And obviously third parties are then trying to push those products out in the market. Ultimately it's the patients that are suffering, right? Uh, there was an issue with uh, a, a client where, you know, these are vaccines and there was an, ex, uh, you know, temperature extrusion 
as a result of which uh, some of these vaccines, a large quantum of these had to be distributed, uh, had to be destroyed, incinerated. But uh, whilst the, the client had the various SOPs, which lay down, you know, photos to be taken um, at the time of the incineration or prior to the incineration and the entire process through which the, the product went through the incineration cycle, uh, the photos and the videos were taken only of the, the initial set of quantities, but then uh, which were destroyed, but a huge sum, about 90% of the quantities actually didn't get destroyed and then moved from uh, the incinerator premises uh, up in through the various channels up through uh, the north of India and then sold through, uh, you know, uh, the markets in North India. Um, again, when we when we engage C, uh, the CFAs and the distributors, what is the level of uh, review? Uh, what is the level of review that uh, you know VS companies undertake in terms of their credibility? Right? Uh, what generally it's uh, you know the third party is appointed basis uh, the the clients and the credentials that the third party has, but uh, you know, what are the business ethics in, in that is the area, I guess, needs to be focused in an area of laxity because the, the aim of the company is to push sales, but are we engaging with third parties uh, whose business ethics are questionable? If that's the case today, yes, the third party will help you push the, push the sales, but ultimately at some point in time, it may come to bite you. Uh, the next one's more in terms of market access. Um, you know, companies are in the mode of expansion into markets outside India. And uh, when we are appointing third parties, got to be, uh, you know, careful in terms of uh, doing appropriate due diligence because we've seen that um, many a times third parties uh, uh, get into unethical practices, misconduct, uh, when I say unethical practice, not only bribery, corruption, but beyond that, when some of your products are sold, uh, it is a area of, uh, you know, uh, great concern, because ultimately, it's the company um, that's product and the names and the brand of the company that is impacted. Uh, patient access programs, uh, an area of concern uh, whilst the the intention is to make available products um, to patients at a value that uh, you know those patients can afford uh, you you've got various schemes there depending on the company and depending on uh, the products that have been sold um, you, you may have you pay for one get two free or what have you and we've seen instances where specifically uh, where you've got, uh, you know, uh, especially, you know, in areas where patients are suffering from, uh, say, cancer or other terminal illness and products are um, the patient assistant programs for those. Uh, we've seen, um, you know, leakages where um, patients are no longer there, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, the program continues and products are being shown as if they're being dispatched to some of those patients, but uh, actually it's getting diverted. So again, uh, you know, which is the third party that's managing your programs and doing an assessment of the third party is key uh, there. We've seen instances where third parties have claimed that they've got you know, X number of individuals who are going to be manning the phone, have heard, you know, are well trained in your program. So they will they will be able to educate the patient when the patient calls. But when we visited some of these, you know, we've been we've con conducted audits and visited some of these third parties, we, uh, you know, we've identified that actually um, anybody, so it's like a call center where you've got 100 people uh, attending to calls in the contract with the pharma company, uh, the company was informed that they'll have five or 10, um, you know, dedicated resources who will be taking these patient calls. But uh, actually when you go on, on the ground, uh, we've noticed that the calls are picked up by, uh, you know, any of the 50 people. So 
call forwarding facility is not restricted to the five or 10 and other areas as well. But this is just one of the examples I thought uh, I'll share with you. Um, next slide, please. Any questions on the, on the pharma before I move on to the hospital part? So it says, by working in pharma industry, I found that there are over focus approach by US of cases from 483s toward ban on generic companies, price antibiotic. I think it's more of a statement. If HCPs have attached pharmacies, commercial discounts offered to such pharmacies, I guess, uh, as long as you know there is a difference between the pharmacy and the patient and the HCP that is maintained uh, should be fine. Um, if a CME is for two hours, if he continues after his speaking for 20, 30 minutes, then continues for remaining period, is it reasonable to say you have to pay for two hours if it be? Uh, if it's CME is for two hours, you will want an HCP to stay there for two hours. Yes, it's fair to pay the HCP for two hours. In PAPs, how the patient identified, how it ensures that patient actually getting the intended benefit. Absolutely, uh, you know, uh, while, as I said, uh, the programs are set such that, uh, you know, uh, it helps uh, the patients, but uh, it's the greed uh, of, the, of the parties in the middle uh, who gets to who gets to them, uh, and uh, as a result, the actual patient suffers, or the patient no longer exists. But then the the frauds occurring on the company. So moving on to the hospital sector, and while there are various fraud uh, issues that we put out, uh, more so on the financial statement frauds, in terms of revenue recognition disbursements, I won't cover all of those. Uh, in the essence of time, but the two key areas in a hospital is the, the procurement side, when the hospital is procuring, and generally it's the over-invoicing, vendor favoritism, the kickbacks uh, received uh, by some of the individuals who are the key decision makers at these hospitals, um, you know, be it uh, medicines, be it machines, uh, you know, medical devices that are coming through uh, is an area, is a large area of concern. And on the vendor side, you've got, uh, you know, issues of carteling price, um, you know, uh, rigging as well. Um, yes, there's one aspect, uh, you know, I, I missed covering earlier is, um, the whole issue, this is more on the pharma side where you've got, uh, you know, products which are for institutional sales actually getting diverted uh, for retail consumption because institutional sale price is different. Um, we've had issues where rather clients have issued where, uh, you know, bogus or fake institutional orders have been put into the system. Uh, and then pricing uh, determined basis, uh, the pricing for the government. Uh, unfortunately, it's a it's a mixed bag because the third party, uh, most companies have a, a single common third party that deals with private uh, as well as institutional sales, and that's where it causes the concern uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that the accuracy that the products that are meant for institutionals. Actually, one is you've got the order from the institution, and that's why you know the pricing should be a appropriate, uh, should be matching with the pricing that is for the institution. And there is no crisscrossing. It's actually one way going from the institutional um, product dispensation to uh, the private sector. Coming back to uh, the hospital frauds, the second big part is the entire aspect of billing and more so one is billing for the patients. The second is the claims that, uh, you know, the the hospitals filed with, uh, you know, the insurance companies. Now, when I say insurance, there are certain insurance companies uh, that have got a huge team uh, checking and it's the learning curve for them as well in terms of the claims coming through. Uh, we've also 
been helping on the Ayushman Bharat. I was talking earlier um, uh, on on this aspect where you know hospitals associated uh, or running the Ayushman Bharat uh, you know uh, programs um, whereby the hospitals are supposed to be sending over uh, the claim forms to uh, the regulators. There have been issues in terms of you know. Um, fake invoices, duplicate invoices, manipulative claims that are being filed. And, uh, you know, th that's where some of the controls, uh, you know, need to be put into place uh, by the insurance companies. And in this case, whereas Ayushman Bharat, the regulator has put in recently, there was a, a and it's been in the news for quite some time, um, you know, recently, I think about uh, 16,000 hospitals have been kind of blacklisted. Uh, because of uh, frauds in the claims submission. Um, any questions? Manipulation of discount sales in Egypt, yes, by distributors handling key accounts to control these only blockchain systems. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, blockchain will help. Again, it's uh, the human mind Right. The human mind has created blockchains. Um, and you've got uh, fraudsters. Uh, again, it's the human mind, which at some point in time will uh, try and identify areas uh, which can be, uh, which are susceptible to fraud and try and break through. But uh, till then, I think, uh, yes, blockchain uh, is an area of focus. Uh, and that's where uh, the companies are moving. Yes, there is an expense element that needs to be considered in terms of you know price of your product versus onboarding all your project products onto this uh, platform. We'll move on. Um, Puja. So Puja, you want to take the case studies? Any questions on the previous? Uh, sorry, any questions? Yeah, the, I think the last one is uh, a lot of these frauds. Uh, absolutely, absolutely agree uh, with you. There are a lot of these frauds uh, continue in the all the emerging markets, more so in the African markets. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, we've seen this in India as well as other emerging markets. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So uh, Darshan spoke about the PAP review. So there were these two specific engagements which we covered. Uh, one was a review of the PAP program. Uh, this was a part of our quarterly monitoring to review the data sets pertaining to the PAP program. Uh, on this engagement, we did we run uh, we ran a lot of data analytics uh, on the patient data on the HCP data. The objective of this was to identify trends and patterns which are not the usual, uh, you know, uh, a, a particular trend which brings out a story, it raises certain questions, typically from a patient authenticity point of view. I think somebody had also raised a question that how do we even ensure that the patient is really there or the patient is authentic. So with that objective, you know, these analytics did throw up certain outliers, certain trends, which did not seem right deeper dive into those uh, we, we were able to identify potentially fake uh, patients the way these were identified was say you know we would review the end-to-end -end documentation we saw that the personal identification details of the patient those were fake uh, you know it was a pan number associated with some other name versus what was submitted in the file was uh, you know it was tampered with uh, we noted that there were certain prescriptions from an HCP, uh, but when we further did a research, uh, you, you know, that HCP was not engaged with that hospital uh, on the letterhead on which the prescription was. So there were a lot of these, uh, you know, identifications which did allude to the fact that is there even a patient at the back of it or not. Uh, overall, it did lead to uh, understanding what gaps were there. Uh, there were clearly gaps in the system which were well known to a few people in the organization and they were being exploited. 
so uh, doing this kind of a risk assessment a fraud risk assessment from a fraud lens and trying and fixing the loopholes at a process level also becomes important uh, so that some of these occurrences don't happen uh, very casually uh the other engagement which we did was again it was for a multinational pharma company uh, and it was to do risk assessment of the overall patient access program uh so on this risk assessment the kind of patients were done over call uh, and then you don't really know who on the other side is picking up the call whether the patient is still alive or dead uh, or, or not there or whether you know the patient is even taking the prescribed medicine uh, uh, there was uh, there was it was prone to very high frauds if an in person verification was not conducted uh, so that's how uh, we identified that how an in person verification would reduce the occurrences of those frauds uh, there was lack of oversight on the third party administrators darshan also did speak about the call center management part of it uh there were free of cost medications uh there was lapse in verification of usage of those medications whether they were really used or not uh whether they were then you know from the back end from the back door going back to the company to the company personnel who were probably giving it to the hcps so there were a lot of concerns which came on the process itself uh of course in pad the most important aspect is maintaining confidentiality we we noted that there were lapses again from the third party side because the names of the patient or identification such as mobile number were not even masked uh this raises raised question in terms of firewalls between the pap and the sales staff uh, we also noted instances where the sales sales staff himself had called the patient sales staff of the organization so uh, you know a lot of these red flags were identified and it did help the company to fix some of these at a process level we thought you know covering some of these case studies uh, the way we've done engagement speaking about our experiences would would really help uh, and make this more interactive and probably you'll be able to resonate better with some of these examples so we've tried and covered varied topics by way of these case studies uh, so the next one is on review of contracts and transactions with external consultants and typically when these consultants have government touch point uh, these were done with a lens of any bribery or corruption risk which prevailed Firstly, uh, so uh, from the entire universe of third parties, which are the high-risk third parties for the company, uh, and when we say high-risk, these are typically uh, consultants having some sort of government touch point, be it say on the custom side, be it on licenses uh, side, or be it on the tendering side, where these uh, there are these agents which. are uh, engaged so we the consultants and we also looked at the backup transaction uh, documentation such as contracts invoices uh, what is the work actually which was performed uh, we did identify there were you know risks from a, again from a bribery and corruption point of view uh, there were these common typical common fraud schemes so in the contract there would just be one liner which would be stated in terms because of the scope of work uh, so the amount which is paid to the consultant visa is the work that the consultant is doing the contract was so weakly worded uh, that it demonstrated a very high value which has been given to the consultant but against that a detailed scope of work was not mentioned so then that raised a question that is it really payment for consultancy charges or is it you know creating funding for giving a bribe payment so that was one of the instances uh, in another case uh, what we noted was there was this agent which was engaged uh, and we spoke about even the multilateral development banks right so it was a pharma company which had received funding uh, which which had submitted tender on a multilateral on a world bank uh, funded tender 
so uh, what was done was that what was disclosed to the multilateral development bank was that the agent would get a two and a half percent commission on this tender and then the scope was laid out quite in detail what the agent would do uh, in terms of pre-tendering post getting the order and then towards closure so all of that was well defined However, one lapse that happened was subsequently there were email chains by this agent saying that, you know, if we have to win this tender, if we have to service this tender, there'll be certain payments, grease payments that the agent will have to do. And the agent requested for uh, half a percentage of an additional commission. The company went and adhered to that request, did not disclose the change in uh, agent commission to the multilateral development bank. So, so that was a trigger point. And then uh, when there were emails which were digged out, there were these communications which came up. Uh, and there were actually certain payments which were made by the agent. So a lot of companies, you know, at times, especially when they are government touch points, uh, these days companies prefer that their books are clean and they are passing on the buck to the third parties. But it probably does not always work uh, because the third parties are seen uh, as an extension to the companies itself. It is very difficult to then disengage and say that we don't know what the third party did or what were the acts of those third party. A uh, lot of times when we are doing such reviews, uh, you know, say on the custom clearance uh, side, uh, on the logistic, on the whole logistic side. So a lot of clients do claim ignorance. So they say that, okay, we, we did obtain competitive quotations. We got the best deal, best price. Uh, we went ahead with this L1 vendor. And then we are paying, paying this vendor a particular sum of money for the various services that they are providing. Now, what are they doing with that money? We don't know. So I, I don't think, you know, claiming that ignorance would really help. Uh, because in terms of the FCPA, in terms of the UKBA, uh, that external consultants, acts of those consultants uh, who are dealing with government on your behalf, you would be responsible for those also. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, spending more time on this because third party is extremely, extremely important. Uh, doing the right set of diligence, uh, ensuring that you have very robust vendor onboarding processes, um, and, you know, when we speak about background checks or due diligences, a lot of companies feel that obtaining probably the GSC certificate or the financials of the vendor, uh, the basic requirement from a finance and tax perspective, a lot of companies term that as a due diligence. But a real due diligence is actually ensuring what is the reputation of that third party. Has that third party in the past been prone to any inquiries? How is that third party dealing with businesses of uh, other clients? So, and especially, you know, for the high risk third parties, it is very important to do that homework before you engage with anyone. Yeah, uh, and I, I also sort of covered the next one, which is on the CFA. So, uh, you know, similar observations. Uh, there was an investigation with regards to one of the transaction. Uh, there were instances of misappropriation of collections by the CFA transactions, which were there with the client versus the transactions which were maintained with the CFA for the same client. Uh, we did end-to-end -end review of the entire chain of documentation right from purchase orders invoices lorry receipt the dispatch receipts and then the collection entries and stuff uh you know a lot of and the vendor in connivance with an employee did perpetrate uh, a fraud and the modest Pooja, you're cutting off. Pooja. Was uh, noticed that there was a yeah. Is it your, better? Your internet, yeah, internet connection problem. I just check. Yeah, should be okay now. Uh, so on the lorry receipt, what we identified, there was this dispatch vehicle, um, which was shown there were two consecutive entries in, on two different days, whereas the material was coming from about 1,500 kilometers away. 
so there was no way that the same dispatch vehicle could have come back the second day again so these kind of instances uh, there were lapses in the gate entry register the manual gate entry register versus what really came in uh, what we also noted was uh, that the payment slip the payment slips were not recorded uh, the way the way bridge was not linked to sap and the employee knew about this fact and you know that loophole was uh, sort of exploited uh moving on to the next nature of expense uh was on the event expenditure uh so majority of the expenses which were incurred for an event it pertained to an employee reimbursement uh we ran analytic analytic checks again on the venue appropriateness there were certain trends we also did public domain searches and social uh, media searches uh so firstly we identified that there was no event which was conducted at all on that particular day for which the expense was claimed uh and as a proof there were photographs which were submitted uh when we did some quick google search we identified that the photograph of the event which was submitted was ideally of another event which was conducted about 2 years ago so you know this particular employee he picked up an invoice he did some photoshop he he transformed a color image into a black and white image did some cropping and submitted all of those as a part of uh, an event occurrence so again the way uh, you know this entire cme was shown to be conducted it had an agreement with an hcp it had a payment to an hcp which was made it did have an agenda which was put on place it had photographs it had attendance sheets i mean you know in terms of documentation it was all women proper uh, it fulfilled all the requirements from a checklist point of view uh, which the employee did extremely well uh, and this transaction had passed through not just the amount which went to the hcp uh, but also showing a hotel invoice of a significant amount uh but then yeah you know there were these deep dives which indicated uh, you, even the attendance sheet the way the signatures were done uh, through an handwriting analysis we identified that it was probably the same person who's done signatures on on all the attendees list um, ag again photograph which was picked up from google of an earlier event uh, that clearly showed that it was a complete fake event uh, which was shown to be legit by putting up robust documentation right and then the next one uh, is again covering the third parties where there were acceptance of gifts and kickbacks from suppliers in lieu of rewards uh, so it was a procurement head in connivance with the procurement team uh, was accepting these gifts and kickbacks uh, this was identified through a whistleblower complaint an anonymous whistleblower complaint who who did indicate uh, you know names of certain vendors uh, in terms of our work procedures we did conduct imaging of the procurements head heads laptop uh, and we did identify communications between the target employee and the vendors um, and because we had certain indication of which these vendors could be uh, our focus on when we do certain uh, steps in terms of disk imaging checks uh, you know our focus was were there one on one communication with the vendors uh, we did identify that there were templates there were quotation templates there were invoice templates in editable format which were present on on the laptop of the procurement head uh and while and the trend and pattern that came up was that uh whenever there were business related communication with that vendor a uh, lot of people from the procurement team from the finance team from the business teams were somebody or the other was always marked uh, but if these were uh, you know such formats or, or these were information where a misconduct could be perpetrated it was just you know one on one where where the communication was just one on one between the employee and the vendor uh we also identified of uh, the procurement head had uh, had formed a company and there were common directors with this another company who was engaged as a vendor in this company uh again you know 
weak background checks not just on the vendor but even on the employee uh, what we then also realized was that the company did not have a robust code of conduct uh, defining a conflict of interest uh, policy or even seeking and obtaining declaration uh, from their employees that please come and disclose so because of this what happened was that the employee said okay i never knew that i had to disclose this conflict of interest nobody ever asked me which is why i did not in uh that's when you know the company realized that okay we should look into our policies uh you know the way we've drafted it do we even have a mechanism to obtain some of these declarations uh um, now moving on to these two specific cases uh which are on hcp engagements uh so there there are certain requirements in terms of engaging a government hcp the government hcp is expected to obtain noc from the department with which they are engaged to be able to uh, be associated with a private event or to receive any kind of proceeds by way of honorarium uh here what we noted was that the company employee he had uh, probably stated the engage the hcp to be a non government hcp so that it does not have to go through the whole rigor of approval even within their own organization uh, but then when we looked at the cv of the hcp we did certain public domain searches the hcp was a professor at one of the government medical colleges which made him a quasi government association the cv was very smartly rigged and this experience was kind of masked it was removed out so that it does not raise trigger uh and also the in terms of fmv there have been we we've noticed uh, areas where just to get a better tier rating the cvs are again rigged to show more experience or show that they've been associated on speaker engagements on national and international forums so that the experience is adjusted for an higher fm so some of these things you know may land the company into a greater trouble as against doing it in the right way uh i just like to add only, here yeah. i just like to add here so in one of the instances we seen that you know whilst the sales team had government uh, you know an acp working in the government uh, one of the government hospitals uh um, the sales team wanted uh, that acp to be you know speaking at one of their events but because of their internal protocols uh, which uh, did not allow them to engage a government acp or uh, or the acp couldn't get the department approval uh, the sales team uh, manipulated the cv to show that recently he had joined the private practice and uh, you know the the client engaged into uh, a, a, you know consulting agreement with that acp acp was a speaker traveled internationally ultimately one of that acp's colleagues blew the whistle to the department of health uh, you know questioning how uh, this entity um, you know engaged with the acp because that acp had not got an approval as a result of which the department of health had reached out to uh, you know the company asking for an inquiry to be conducted so again we got to be uh, slightly careful specifically when there is a a touch point uh, with the government uh, hcp continue please yeah and then earlier in our discussion we were talking about the expenses which are incurred for hcp attending international congresses national or international congresses uh this was again for a multinational pharma company who had extremely stringent policies in terms of whenever an hcp is sponsored as a delegate to international medical congresses uh, what are the protocols which were required to be followed here in terms of the trigger point uh, there were three or four hcps which were Uh, sponsored for a congress there was just this one hcp who had an higher expense as compared to other hcps in depth review of those expenses it did show uh, that the hcp had extended the hotel stay for four days post the event whereas the policy only allowed one day prior and one day post the event uh, the 
invoice hotel invoice which was submitted in the hotel records did not show this it showed that the hcp only stayed for one day and the per night cost was inflated uh, again in terms of occupancy the hotel invoice which was submitted was manipulated to show single occupancy but then when we obtained the hotel stay invoice directly from the hotel we noted whatever changes were we were been made and we noted that it was a double occupancy which did indicate that there was a family member also which was accompanied yeah then the next one is again on kickbacks from favored vendors uh, we did speak about our methodology in investigation methodology we, we did cover aspects other aspects but i would like to spend time on market intelligence uh, so while some of this information is here say in nature it does help uh, us as investigators to lead us into the right direction uh, gathering these intelligence in a discrete manner brings out a lot of uh, facts to the table and then we try and corroborate those facts through what we see in in the invoices in financial information or even on integrity issues not just about the alleged person but if there is a larger team which is involved so in in this particular case it was really inputs from intelligence which did help us crack the case yeah 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 and then the next one is on misappropriation of funds by fraudulently recording disbursements uh, so the company had suspected that one of its employee was fraudulently recording disbursements uh, this was an engagement which uh, touched upon a lot of different aspects uh, we we did acquire the image of the employee's laptop we did extensive analysis of data trends which the analysis showed up and what we noted was that the siphoning of funds was done during almost 9 out of 10 years which was a tenure of the employee there were manual checks which were routed through other companies which were held by the employee and his spouse uh, while it was easy to identify some which directly went through these companies uh, one trail that this employee typically left was there were about 36 transactions uh, which were perpetrated each of those transactions the last two digit were were ranging from 91 to 98 so it was typically done to uh, you know not cross the threshold say you know if 10 lakh was a threshold where you would need a third signatory so the amounts were always 9 lakh 99098 or 9 lakh 5097 so uh, what i'm trying to say is that a puppet trader does leave out certain trades uh, of course you know if the employee was able to do it over a period of 8 to 9 years the employee was extremely smart in covering up all the tracks but somewhere or the other they do leave leave through trails uh, they do exploit certain loopholes which are prevalent in the system and that's what companies needs to be mindful of yeah so that pretty much completes the case studies um and we can again open it up to questions i am sure you heard a lot of interesting stories and will will be good to hear your experiences or any instances where you would need our guidance so there are a few questions and i'll cover uh, you know uh, some of them so one of the questions is many a time fraudsters don't leave traces uh, financial activities are conducted through their family members bank accounts absolutely right and we've had instances uh, many times you've got lucky yeah, if i might use the word uh, you know sometimes it's difficult uh, but uh, like pooja said uh, fraudsters somewhere uh, do leave a trace it could be when we image their laptops a bank statement or some kind of indication some email coming through uh, you know with uh, details about uh, you know uh, their family activity or other documentation in relation to uh, you know uh, the uh, the fraud that's been conducted so uh, one of the one of the in one of the cases right uh, this individual who's taking kickbacks uh, a senior individual at at a 
at a company, um, you know, had a, a, a security agency guard, uh, you know, open an account, uh, you know, so the account was opened in, in, in the name of a security guard. However, the SMS of any transaction in the bank would come to his phone, right? So we tried everything and uh, but could not get that linkage of where why is the money going to the security service uh, agency um, you know the deposits were happening in that account but every time it would come back uh, you know uh, the sms would come to this individual's phone and when we imaged the phone they looked through the through the messages uh, we saw these alerts coming through uh, and uh, that's where uh, the individual then confessed so similar to this, uh, there would be some, uh, you know, it could be an iota of evidence, uh, but that's the evidence that is generally clenching and helps uh, put an end to the case. Uh, there is no, I wouldn't say there is a checklist of things uh, that can be put out to say these are the, you know, uh, it could be an illustrative list, but never an exhaustive list. Uh, another question relates to, um, how frauds lodging of false claims uh, yes we've had instances where you know either the patients uh, yes has been admitted or many times patient has not been admitted uh, patients trying to make uh, may not even be a patient people trying to make some money collude with hospitals enroll themselves as a patient and then the entire uh, hospital visit is uh, is for, is bogus or uh, you know fake uh, generally doesn't happen at the larger hospitals it's more uh, at the mid-size or the clinics where some of this is happening um, you know or additional uh, procedures that have actually not been performed uh, is an area of concern as well um, the next question is in relation to cashless absolutely this is more at the payer end uh, this is how you know again we've seen and in our practical lives as well the first thing the question is asked is do you have insurance or not and depending on the answer uh, you know that you give whether it's cashless or you're paying on your own uh, the charges uh, are kind of determined obviously they're not told to you but when you see the invoice uh, you you'll get a sense of uh, you know where if you're paying on your own you paid far more excess most probably uh, I wouldn't say we are experts. I don't know. I have personally not um, come across export incentive schemes in the pharma industry, so I wouldn't like to um, touch upon that. Uh, I don't know, Pooja, if you've looked at export incentive schemes. Um, no, no, that's true. Yeah. Uh, the last one, is there any agency that can help uninsured hospital patients face huge uh, inflated bills? Um, I didn't kind of get that uh, question, honestly. Hospital patients, sorry, it's helping the patients per se. Um, uh, I, I, sorry, I'm not able to uh, understand the question. Um, but we can, you know, if you want to put it out again, we can cover it later as well. I know we are running short of time. So, Pooja, do you want to just quickly cover anti-fraud controls and probably leave five, seven minutes at the end? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so, managing fraud risk, and there are three very important pillars to it. One is on the prevention side, the detection side, and the response side. So, in terms of prevention, making sure that we have very effective measures in terms of putting out the policies, processes, identifying uh, the gaps in implementation, because a lot of times we see that the companies set up very robust policies and procedures, but it's where the implementation which really fails. So testing the implementation and identifying those gaps and uh, closing those loopholes is equally important from a prevention point of view building those very strong controls within the system uh, assessing periodic assessment of these processes uh, because of course you know the companies do mature over a period of time there is exponential growth which happen in the companies uh, but whether the policies and processes are also tweaked and are they uh, really you know there to address the changing dynamics of a business that's where 
you know a lot of companies do miss out so that's very important on the prevention side uh, on the detection side uh, we see a lot of emphasis on proactive analysis of data we spoke about a lot of examples where it was an unusual data pattern or trend which brought out uh, you know red flags uh, again you know use of technology here and using digital assets is extremely important uh, because they do have capabilities to churn around large volumes of data identifying trends and patterns which a human eye will not be able to do it or it would miss out uh, so continuous auditing monitoring doing proactive analysis of data from a detection standpoint is extremely important and the third and the most important pillar is is the response uh, you know how robust are companies whistleblower mechanisms uh, how seriously are some of these cases being taken how are they investigated is there a root cause analysis which is performed on the backdrop of the investigation case and uh, does that circle back into the prevention space where those loopholes the root cause analysis the loopholes which the root, root cause analysis brought about how are those addressed and changed and how are those monitored again in terms of implementation so this entire cycle of uh, prevention detection and having a strong uh, response mechanism would ideally help a company to manage the fraud risk uh, and technology as we know is being a very important pillar across all the work that we do um again why is it important to prevent and detect fraud uh, I, i i think needless to say it's important to see a fraud to recognize a fraud when you see it having a dynamic approach uh, absolutely using the power of technology to unearth some of the frauds which could happen uh what what we've seen is that the cost to investigate the kind of reputational damage that it cause it causes is very difficult and very challenging which is why it is important uh, that at a prevention and at a detection stage also there is investment not just from the money point of view but there is time which is invested by companies uh, in one of our past uh, trends what we've seen is companies who invested in fraud prevention a uh, lot of companies feel that it's probably a waste of money they feel that there is so much money that we are spending uh, without anything happening but as per the trend companies who invested at the onset on a prevention side then see lower cost incurred when a fraud actually occurs and more than the cost it is really the safeguard on the reputation side which is more important uh, of course you know there are very high fines and penalties uh, those get avoided if you are able to spend time spend effort uh, right at the detection stage uh, we we have to quickly cover these 10 topics in terms of you know how a better governance would ensure that a organization is staying up in terms of overall fraud risk so the first one is building trust in the financial information uh, there is a very strong outlook in terms of accurate and transparent disclosures uh, even if a wrong incident were to happen in in a company rather than uh, you know hiding the tracks it is important that there is transparency and accuracy in uh, declaration do transactions lack substance over form uh, we touched upon one one right sample uh, case where the entire documentation was prepared proper uh, but did it lack substance over form that is a question that we need to ask that while it ticked all check all check boxes but was it a alleged expense or was it something just to cover up a track uh, so in terms of the trends that we are seeing which companies are adopting is a trust but verify kind of an approach which lays out very strong communication across the organization that yeah there is trust but it's important to verify the occurrences of event uh, we are also seeing lot of uh, proactive monitoring especially on the end utilization of funds where the funds are getting actually getting exchanged and there is also a heightened uh, activity around the forensic due diligence which is not just doing a due diligence to tick the box but ensuring that there is a deep dive on the high risk areas and uh, ensuring that the loopholes are sort of covered 
the next one is a on the fraud and misconduct risk changing operations based on changing dynamics of businesses uh, of course you know we are in the post covid era and covid is also brought about a lot of change in the way businesses operate so doing a re look and reassessment of the fraud risk of the bribery and corruption risk making sure that we are keeping pace with the regulatory framework uh, adjusting controls to reflect the post covid environment and typically the work from home environment is important so the next one is on the safeguarding of business interest uh, and in this era of social media fake news spreads extremely fast uh, there are data privacy and confidentiality regulations which have uh, been recently implemented uh, which we have not seen in the past how does that impact a company Uh, and we we are seeing a lot of traction in terms of deploying early warning early warning signals when a fake news is there's even a smell test about a fake news how how do you nip it in the bud and stop it from spreading ahead uh, how do we ensure that data privacy concerns have been dealt with uh, especially for pharma this is extremely important because there is so much of sensitive information which has been dealt with there is patient information uh, there is information about clinical trials which are very confidential in nature how robust are company company controls to ensure that the date first of all that uh, there is good identification of what is uh, personal information or what is information or data which is very sensitive and then second how is a evaluation in terms of safeguarding that the information and data which is acquired is is stored in a manner which cannot be exploited right and then the next topic is on insider threat uh, by inside people only perpetrated by employees uh, which do cause irreparable reputational damage um we spoke about code of conduct ensuring that how a code of conduct covers all aspects as it relates to insider threats uh there is a, a lot of virtual interaction now there is unsupervised digital space uh you know the, this call which is happening right now the recording which is happening how well it is stored is it misused in any way so some, some of these we looking at some of these aspects and ensuring that we have appropriate policies in place uh, so that the virtual space the digital space is not misutilized uh, a to phone and voice uh, and when i say talking need not always be a verbal communication but by way of emailers uh, we've seen that you know putting up posters reinforcing some of the messaging that you have to give by way of screen shares uh, uh, the you know laptop screen savers by way of posters uh, their communication in and around festive times on sensitive expense areas so some of these tone at the top uh, is important to counter the insider threat also use of advanced forensic technology to predict behavior to predict a fraudster's behavior is important that does help you to re look at your policies procedures uh, the way the way things have been put together and uh, enhance some of those aspects with changing trends uh, again on fund diversion there are instances of round tripping there are instances of evergreening uh, the loan environment outside is also changed quite a bit the overall lending business has changed so uh, how 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 is you know the financial information maintained and managed is uh, important there have been instances where personal profiteering is been done so ensuring that how well are your financial controls uh, how well are those to detect a potential fund diversion where the intended money is not go the money is not going to going to the intended beneficiary but it is going it's getting passed on to someone else uh, 
again similar aspects you know frequent audits uh, special purpose audits which are not very generic so a lot of times you know companies do come and tell us that we are already doing internal audit but is an internal audit robust enough to address a fraud scenario probably the answer is no which is where a special purpose audit where you know the internal audit brings across lapses in certain areas doing a deep dive on those areas is extremely important and closing the loop on the internal audit side yeah and then you know there is this new paradigm to the whistles uh, in terms of there is reduction in the number of generic complaints in the past we've noted that the whistle blower hotline was more probably instances of personal vendetta uh, there could be instances of non ethical uh, Uh, claims also which were going through the whistle blower hotline however there is increased awareness now uh, people are making sure that they give some evidence by raising a complaint because just raising a complaint would not yield anything uh, even Uja, we are losing you. These are making sure nothing held up against them. Yeah, uh, is it clear now? Yes, good. Hello. Yeah, yeah. So, so making sure that uh, you know we have very strong whistleblower mechanisms, uh, which also aid in getting anonymous complaints, and uh, even board the board is involved into these complaints and how the complaints are resolved. so so that's extremely important to make a whistle blow mechanism more effective on the counterparty risk uh, i i think we spoke enough on on the third party risk and how important it is to manage the increased third party risk uh there are dependencies which are there on these third parties it does require more time than usual to make sure that we get it right a detailed due diligence making sure that the due diligence is linked to the risk that the third party would pose a high risk third party has a detailed and an enhanced due diligence as compared to a usual third party which may not require trigger some of these party risk is addressed yeah and then uh, you know preparing for regulatory probes uh, and we would have we would have all read in recent articles how regulators can come knocking at doors and then you hardly have any time to realize how to react and what to do uh, so ensuring that we have absolute clarity in terms of uh, the privileges that we own ensuring uh, that there are appropriate demonstration by way of to active reviews by way of strong communication which we are able to showcase to the regulators that you know we did everything possible we did trainings we we also have a strong and robust code of conduct uh, we ensured that if there were any cases those were appropriately dealt with there were disciplinary action and even after all this if something did happen it was unfortunate that the company was not able to address it so if you are able to give across this strong demonstration that the company did everything that they could do uh that would relax uh, a little bit uh, you know as compared to instances where we've seen where most of the company failed to demonstrate their obligation itself which raises question that was it really the intent of the company only or was it the intent of the employee who would have perpetrated a fraud or a misconduct right and then on the digital transformation uh, there is very strong acceleration that we are seeing usage of artificial intelligence machine learning uh, even the rpas are becoming extremely popular uh, in terms of internet of things will give rise to new data sources uh, we initially spoke a little bit about blockchain so blockchain is again uh, you know the new way to look at things so upping the game in terms of digital transformation uh, and ensuring that the companies are abreast with uh, some of the digital arena is uh, another important aspect for companies 
yeah and then a renewed commitment to crisis management uh, crisis in any shape and form uh, even covid crisis the way when it hit us a lot of companies did struggle as to how do we respond to a crisis and how instead of struggling how do we emerge stronger so it is not just important to lay out a strong crisis framework but even test the crisis management plans and how effective those are uh, also learning from the past would be important to imbibe in the crisis management plan thanks pooja yeah so, so be are... strong sorry these these are ten very strong pillars topics uh, are quite power punched uh, you know if companies do recognize these ten areas and they are able to put on controls on these areas uh, these would enhance and ensure that your fraud risks are minimal so i'll just take on some of the questions that have come about one was in relation to you know uh, the tool um yes there are tools uh, you know that are available uh, but the tool is as good as you know the information that's put in right uh, specifically as we 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 talk about it uh, you know there will be false positives but it's a learning curve and like uh, pooja talked about uh, the ai piece of it right and as well as machine learning Uh, the first time you will have significant amount of false positives again it all depends upon how uh, you what are the areas that you want to look at in terms of the output if that's well defined uh, even then you will have false positives but the number of false positives will be reduced and it's a learning process right? the first time even for a human uh, you, you you know the chances of failure is high but as you learn and generally what we do is we let the tools that we have run and you know at some point in time if we see a lot of false positives then hope is lost but if you take some of those learnings and tweak the rules that have been written to identify uh, you know uh, the issues uh, thereby minimizing um, you know the false positives again you're never going to get a tool that's going to spit out uh, 100% uh, positives because again uh, it's the human mind right uh, you know if we uh, we can build tools and tweak languages the human uh, tweak the codes to identify uh, you know inappropriate behavior uh, it's the same human mind which will try and identify ways in which uh you can uh, you know uh, identify ways in which you can circumvent uh, the controls that you put into place so uh, it's yes it's a chicken and egg story but uh, it's, it's, you know uh, the machine learning and the ai is improving um, the second piece is on risk mitigation tools yes there are uh, various tools available in the market uh, but one of the key things is generally our focus is on getting a tool but if we take step back and this is going back to basics have we identified all the tools uh, oh, sorry have we identified all the relevant risk to the granular detail you know companies engage in erm exercises and say procurement exercises but when we look at it generally when we ask is there a risk of corruption is there a risk of fraud to senior management to middle management the answer is no if if we start off with a no answer uh, then we are never going to build a system in forget building a system we are never going to identify if there are avenues where a forester can make hay right the first point is accepting yes that an organization is susceptible to fraud at the moment we pass that barrier is 50% of the battle is won and then get into the details even some of the risk assessment exercises uh, that we've seen where you know uh, companies undertake there are some 10 basic risks that have been identified and there, there is isn't much granularity i think it's the the more granular you go and then yes every organization has certain controls right and you map those controls certain controls that have identified as part of you know your regular processes will uh, work as 
uh, you know, uh, fraud risk controls. There might be a few that need to be added, which is fine. But looking at it from an independence lens, uh, independent lens, and looking at it more from a fraud risk uh, to say, can a third party, can one of my employees, yes, we trust our employees, but are there, uh, you know, is there someone within our system who can commit a fraud because of the laxity in the system? If, if, if we keep our minds open to that aspect and we create a robust, uh, you know, conduct a robust risk assessment exercise, then building a tool around that and putting in the codes and what is it that you want to see uh, as output, that is the second phase. Uh, the risk mitigation, again, the appetite of companies to spend on a preventive issue is generally lower. Uh, you know, once an issue has occurred, then, you know, you'll have to play it through the nose uh, to, to identify the root cause. And that's where, you know, a lot of money, money is one aspect, but management time, um, you know, is, is critical, right? They would rather focus on the business than dealing with burning issues. So that's, again, a chicken egg story because you don't want to spend um but then if something happens then you're going to spend not only money but also your time um, you know so uh, that's my two two cents around that there was one more question around whether a tpa can assist private patients i am not sure uh, probably uh, a question that uh, you know Patients may have to reach out directly to the DPA. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for having us.